Hello and welcome everyone to our event today. Um, I'm happy to see the large number of you here present. Um, and uh, we will be covering today um, two, of, uh, two of the hardest topics in the Atlassian uh, tools uh, currently. The first one is, as you may already know, the, due to the deprecation of the server licenses, uh, we'll be talking about migrations from server licenses to cloud or to uh, data center license. And then we'll discuss uh, how you can make your life easier with the use of asset management and forms in uh, the, uh, with Jira software and Jira service management. Um, just a short information, this event is uh, organized by Sivus, which is part of the Aricoma group. We are um, 4,500 people oriented on, on the, for the European market. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Chodomir Dimitrovsk and I'll be your host today. Um, and uh, I, I was I'm working already 14 years uh, with Sivus, um, currently holding the head of ITSM vendor management uh, position. And um, I'm managing the team that works uh, with different ITSM tools, but currently we'll be discussing the Atlassian tools today. Uh, with me, I have uh, two of our uh, best uh, people in the team. Uh, Ms. Nalitza Gaber, she is a technical lead with the team. And we have uh, Mr. Nenad Misic, uh, Intermediate uh, Atlassian uh, Specialist. Uh, they'll be covering the, the two subjects, as I mentioned, Atlassian migra uh, migrations to cloud and uh, asset management with, uh, with Jira. So uh, I'll invite Nalitza Gavar to start the first part of the presentation. So Nalitza, please. Thank you. Thank you, Trello. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody. I am very happy to be in our Stockholm office here today and very happy to be uh, with you and share with uh, all of you here and all of you who are watching us uh, via the YouTube channel our expertise, our know-hows and our takeaways uh, in relates to migrating uh, the Atlassian, Atlassian tools from on-prem to, to the cloud. Um, let me take my okay uh, I will go one step back before I start uh, explaining how we do uh, the migrations and I will talk a little bit about why going on cloud at first uh, Chelomir already mentioned that Atlassian decided to discontinue the server licenses by the end of 2024. But however, we've been doing migrations even before Atlassian introduced this uh, discontinuing of the server licenses. That is because uh, few of their, some of their customers recognize the value of being on cloud. Why is that? You can see in the picture in the presentation that uh, when you host the Atlassian uh, 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 host the Atlassian tools uh, on your own premises wh when, there's, when they are self-managed, uh, then a customer needs to take care of uh, the server where these uh, applications are running, so of the uh, operating system, uh, um, maintaining the, both the hardware and the software uh, on, uh, on the place where these uh, tools are running. Also, they are responsible for upgrading the Atlassian tools, etc. Whereas if uh, you are a customer on cloud, you only worry about the administration and the subscription fee. Uh, the underlying structure that hosts the Atlassian tools is actually uh, fully taken care of uh, by Atlassian. Uh, this way, uh, you're actually freeing up resources uh, to re be that uh, uh, devices or people that uh, will be taking care of the applications and everything. You free up these resources to actually move them towards new investments in your company and then you have a better place on the market overall. So uh, this is the value uh, that customers recognized previously uh, and now, however, by 2024, uh, the server licenses will be discontinued and uh, all of the Atlassian customers will, of course, need to move on cloud or uh, Atlassian gives another solution for their customers that uh, simply cannot uh, um, store their data outside of their uh, premises and that is the data center enterprise solution.
Now, if you are a customer and you are deciding uh, to move from the on-prem uh, to cloud, uh, there are a few things that uh, we advise our clients to take into consideration, and we walk through with the, we walk through whole this journey with them before they make the uh, final decision that they will be actually going on cloud and how uh, all of that will be done. The first thing uh, that uh, we help the customer assess is uh, whether they're allowed to go on the cloud actually, because uh, Atlassian uh, uh, hosts uh, their applications on AWS uh, in different uh, locations around the world. However, you are aware that there are uh, some banking uh, I mean, uh, companies from the banking industry, from the regulatory industries, etc., uh, that uh, <coughs> uh, that cannot uh, store their information there, or they need to have precise uh, knowledge on how this uh, information is stored and stored and uh, and processed. Um <coughs> Atlassian gives uh, the, uh, an option for data residency at some extent, and together with Atlassian, and if you are the ones that uh, uh, are considering and contemplating migrating, we can assess whether the cloud is the right solution for you. I it usually is because, as I mentioned, there is uh, data residency, but at some extent, you can choose to pin uh, some of your, most of your data at uh, location per year choosing, uh, however, some of the data is not pinned, and that is, uh, we, we can help you if you decide to go uh, this route to determine whether this is the right way for you. This is, uh, and uh, so far I was talking about the main underlying applications like Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, uh, Jira, Confluence, and Bitbucket. Uh, however, uh, if you are already an Atlassian customer, you know that. Uh, 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 you don't only have the underlying tools, but you have a lot of add-ons on top of uh, Jira or Confluence or, or, or Bitbucket. And the thing is that um, while on on-prem, the, if the add-on that was installed on top of these applications were storing and processing information, this information was stored uh, on the same location when uh, Jira or Confluence was stored. On the cloud, we have a little bit of different situation. Uh, some of the some of the add-ons, uh, but this is a very small number, uh, store the data uh, where Atlassian uh, tool is hosted, but most of them store and host uh, the data on their own uh, location. Therefore, we've, hep we've helped uh, customers so far. We've, we've had, for example, uh, one migration very recently when the customer had over 25 add-ons installed on top of Jira. And together we've, with uh, them, we went on this journey to assess uh, where each of these add-ons stores the information. We've even helped them establish the good, uh, good um, cooperation with uh, the vendor because they had a very strict legal processes and some additional, um, some additional data processing agreement uh, should have been signed between this customer and the vendor. This is a journey, but it's, it's uh, always done uh, with, with, of course, with our help, and the vendors are uh, uh, aware of uh, these uh, uh, requirements that customers might have and are pretty cooperative. Now, this is, uh, uh, so far, I was talking about the storage of the data. Now, another aspect that is very important uh, before you decide to migrate and uh, when you start to prepare and when we've prepared with our customers is not only where the data is stored with these uh, add-ons, but uh, do the functionalities that these add-ons provide on the on-prem solution and on the cloud match. Sometimes they will not, but uh, so far we've, uh, we've uh, managed to find replacements. Be it, be uh, it doesn't have to be from the same vendor. It might be another vendor that will provide the uh, same or similar fun functionalities that were there on on-prem and to replace them uh, carefully on, on the cloud. So uh, before we migrate, we uh, together with our customers, we assess whether they can migrate, whether they can migrate the add-on data and how they can do it, and of course, uh, how, what is the best way to go to, uh, to um, how would I say, keep the functionalities that we have on on-prem to be matched and same as they are on cloud. Uh, 
After we've, uh, we finish these journeys of assessing and preparing uh, everything, we go on and choose the migration method with which we will migrate, we will actually do the migration uh, itself. Now, Atlassian provides, I would say, two, two methods, and these two methods are used in different situations. Uh, the two methods are the uh, JIRA and Confluence, and there is also a Bitbucket migration assistant. Uh, first, first one is this, and the second one is full uh, XML ex uh, exports and imports. I will start with the migration tools at first. The migration tools are actually add-ons provided by Atlassian that are installed on top of the on-prem solution. And, and what they do is uh, they bring uh, the data that you choose from your on-prem uh, from your on-prem tool to the cloud. When you migrate with this tool, you don't overwrite. We don't overwrite what is there already. We simply add what we want uh, from the on-prem to what is uh, there already on cloud. And this is more suitable method for migration for customers that already have something on their uh, cloud instance and they want to maybe merge some another instance or they didn't uh, they didn't uh, they have two instances one server and cloud they want to bring something from the server to the cloud or uh, also where you have a smaller number of uh, users if the user tier is uh, is smaller then atlassian suggests that uh, we always we um, uh, I mean their customers and us partners use the, uh, the cloud migration assistant. The Jira full cloud XML import and export, as well as Confluence, on the other hand, they, they don't bring what, uh, only what you choose from the on-prem solution to, what you, uh, to your destination site, uh, but they overwrite everything there is on the destination. So this, uh, this type of method, method is more applicable for customers that don't have nothing on cloud and uh, they're now moving from on-prem to the cloud. Or we've had a case uh, where a customer had a project with over 500, uh, uh, over half a million tickets and uh, the migration assistant simply couldn't uh, do the job, couldn't migrate uh, this, uh, this amount of data in one project, and we've opted then for uh, the, the other migration, migration method. So these are the methods, methods we use. We've talked about the methods of migration, we've talked about uh, the add-ons, Another, <coughs> another very important part that we uh, spent uh, time on together with the customers is the users. Uh, user, user migration strategy is a, a specific aspect that I'm uh, enhancing here, uh, because th and that is because um, user handling differs, uh, uh, differs a lot in the on-prem and on the cloud. Uh, namely, uh, if you are Atlassian users uh, already, you know that on uh, on-prem, uh, your unique identifier with which you uh, log in and start working in uh, the system is uh, the username, whereas on cloud, that is the email address of the users. So um, we've had uh, we've had uh, many situations where we needed to tweak the users. Uh, to modify the, the users on, on the on-prem so they match with how the customers would like to use, uh, how the customers would like their authentication to be on the cloud. Uh, there are many, many user migration strategies. Um, I can, I can uh, say that we've uh, uh, done uh, this user manipulation in many ways directly into database with in-house tools that we've developed to help us change email addresses or usernames in bulk, etc. Uh, however, uh, this is uh, something that uh, customer migrating to cloud needs to take into consideration very carefully because the, the users, before you migrate anything from the on-prem solution to the cloud, the users might be uh, must be brought to a format that is suitable uh, for, for the cloud uh, user management. The user migration strategy depends on, of course, the products that are being migrated, whether they are users from external directories, 
Um, it depends on the migration method used that I've mentioned previously. And of course, it depends on whether the customer plans to use uh, SSO single sign-on with Atlassian access. There are some other uh, tweaks and uh, things that uh, should, be, should be done before you migrate the user so the, uh, everything is uh, propagated uh, as it should at the end of the, of the migration. This is, uh, um, I will guide you uh, through uh, our process on how we, do, uh, how we do the migrations. And I think that uh, this is a very, uh, very good example and we advise you to go <laughs> this way if you plan to migrate. First of all, uh, a test migration is a must. Uh, we advise to do at least two test migrations. Uh, I will uh, tell you now why. With the first test migration, uh, because of the different type of add-ons that are present on the marketplace and because of the fact that most of them are migrated in a different way, uh, then um, with the first test migration, we, the customer or a partner such, uh, such as us um, <coughs> goes through all these items and uh, finalizes all the steps how, uh, how uh, all the items will be migrated to, to the cloud. But because this can be a back and forth uh, uh, exercise, a second test migration is needed because at the point of the second test migration, we already know the steps and what we do is we, uh, we count down uh, the duration of each step that is taken, that uh, is needed in order to, uh, the, uh, in order th to the migration to be completed from the beginning to its end. And why is this? Because we must, uh, we, uh, each customer uh, needs to know uh, about the downtime, namely when you're migrating the data, uh, they will have a, a certain downtime. And uh, so these all, these all times and steps that we take during the migration are cal cal calculated, uh, the, the time is summed up, and we, at the end, know how much time will actually the, the production migration take. And we discuss this, we check the timelines with the stakeholders, uh, and of course repeat that if needed. I'm gonna go ahead and show you When I'm talking about two, uh, two test migrations, and I've mentioned, I, I'm saying uh, we're uh, writing down each steps that we take, how much time does it take, which team is responsible, this is how it looks like. So it is always recommended to have one very detailed, one very structured and detailed runbook uh, with all the steps that, uh, because migrations are uh, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but they're uh, common exercise. Uh, client uh, involvement and some actions from their side is needed as well, uh, <coughs> especially if, uh, if, especially for, for example, taking uh, snapshots from their on-prem solution before we do some manipulations. So I will go here and show it to you that we We even divide uh, the steps that we need to take into what we do need to do before downtime, what, we, what can be performed after downtime, uh, steps can be performed in downtime and from one or from multiple accounts. So it's very detailed. We, we have the times here. Basically, each and every tweak that needs to be done into the da database checks before the migrations and this is how the steps <laughs> of one big big migration look li looks like So, we do the 
the test migrations, we fill out this, uh, this RAM book, uh, we tweak it, we start filling it with the first test migration, then we finalize it with the second test migration. If something comes up, um, some, some vendor changes the way they're handling an add-on or etc., maybe uh, this exercise needs to be repeated. However, if all of this is done and uh, the RAM book is uh, detailed and uh, all that uh, I've mentioned, so the add-ons and the user migration strategy is taken into consideration, migrations are executed very smoothly. So as a, as a summary, I would say that uh, migrations from on-prem on to cloud are neither trivial, but uh, also not a very complex, uh, complex exercise or, uh, or a job. Uh, why? They're, they're not uh, trivial because, um, as I mentioned, there are so many aspects that customer needs to think of and uh, us uh, as, um, as uh, partners as well. These are the data, uh, the, uh, the data storage, the add-on and their functionalities, the users and how they will authenticate, uh, how, what will, what uh, would the customer, how would replace, how would the customer replace something if it's not existent on cloud, etc. It is not uh, a very complex on the other hand because as I've mentioned with proper planning, with documenting all the, all the steps, uh, we've uh, completed uh, many um, uh, simple but also very complex migrations, uh, stressless and uh, without any issues. So planning and assessing are crucial for successful migration. Document each relevant step into into a file, we use Confluence, of course, because it's uh, our native uh, document management uh, system. And of course, we always advise to, uh, to don't skip steps, uh, do all the pre uh, needed pre-migration, during migration and post-migration uh, checks. We do it when we do migrations, of course. So we are certain that the uh, migration will be executed swiftly. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nadeza. Uh Before we continue with Nenad, I just want to ask uh, to to let everybody know that uh, we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. We'll have like a panel session, including our other technician here. Uh, so please uh, uh, remember your questions. Uh, let uh, uh, ask Nena to finish his his presentation, and then we'll we'll have a discussion about your uh, about the different topics that you may want to have discussion. Thank you. Nenad? Thank you very much. Thank you, Nada, for breaking the ice and setting bar too high. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I will tend to, to maintain. Uh, before I start, I would like to prepare everything because we are presenting from same, so just one moment, please. See if this works. Now, can you? It's the same. It's the same. I turned down her, so. Okay, we can do it like this as well. So, before I start explaining what, what we are doing and what we try to present here, I want to level us so we are on the same page. Uh, asset in uh, most common uh, term is a uh, way of systematically 
uh, maintain, monitor, upgrade, uh, and dispose uh, in most cost-effective way of your assets and items like uh, either, either software license, either peripherals and stuff like that. In Jira, it's kind of a way of uh, managing uh, your uh, change, changes, incidents, and basically that. But how we understand and what we are going to present to you today is uh, basically that the uh, asset is giving uh, Jira and ticketing system a new depth. So with an asset, you will have a possibility to objectify everything that you need to work for, uh, work with, and also that, 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 uh, that defer to uh, uh, either buildings, either locations, either any kind of information that you think it's relative for your uh, further work and, and for, uh, let's say, ticket, uh, uh, ticket spreading or, you know, uh, classifying. So how does it look? I need to, to show you this in, in real because it's kind of... I'll take seat down so you can see better. So asset inside of uh, just a moment. Where is my mouse now? There is my mouse. Okay. I apologize for this. Let's go. So asset in, in most common common sense is uh, CMDB, where you can st st store the object schemas. Uh, each object schemas can present the uh, unity of an object and, and attributes that are related to a certain uh, field that you, you, you want to present. Uh, they can also be uh, connected among themselves, and they can be later on used and search like that because when you connect them when when you use uh, one object object from one schema inside as an attribute in other object it can it in that point create the reference and that reference are spread like inbound and outbound reference depending on what you want so uh, if you go like that you can have for example uh, import your active directory and use the employees as uh, objects in this case so you can have a better overview i'll use my coworker that just presented as an example, so we can store the details like the name, job title, office. Uh, we can even connect Jira user to it, and we can get all the information that we needed. On the right side, we see that inbound reference are the objects that are connected to her, and below that, we can see the active Jira users, uh, active Jira tickets that she is currently assigned to. Uh, not not its side, especially, but this object that that are related to her, and. Uh, uh, how you uh, <coughs> manipulate the attributes is uh, really interesting because each attribute can be object from a different schema and uh, what will be presented inside of that attribute is uh, depend can be manipulated again with an a AQL or asset query language in this situation. So I use this example to show you the power of it because all of this data is pulled from a single single object type. Uh, I forgot to mention that this is the object types and this is the attributes of that object. So if we go back, again, my mouse is. If we go back and check the peripherals where it's pulled, you can create an object type each for everything or you can, you can just state it as everything and then later on, classified inside of the attributes. So what I did there in those, f in, in those attributes field is I, I said, OK, in, in laptop, you will only present the objects that are stated as a type of a laptop. So everything else is not selectable inside of that field. And I also did that for uh, phones, for monitors, for everything. So in case you want to update it with the wrong, it will just not allow you. So uh, this is the, the most uh, you know, common thing to show. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, there is a graphic uh, interface for for everything, so you can have a better understanding of uh, relation between the objects. So, if we go back to Naditsa and say object graph, and give him a moment, just. I apologize for this. Something is messing up. I presume that it's. In a moment. Uh, 
know something is is messing it up and I assume that it's it's PowerPoint but uh, graphic user interface is uh, as same as the one we show you here so this is the GUI that I wanted to present and you can see all the related uh, connections between the object that you're looking for or in this case exchange product to to everything else uh, the level of the detail that you can achieve uh, I'm really struggling here what's going on So the level of the detail that you can achieve through, through this is uh, tremendous, especially if you want to see uh, items like uh, imported through the discovery. So as you can see, uh, this is all the information that discovery can pull in the manually, but furthermore about it in the part where we will go through the uh, ways to import the stuff. Now, the second, second part. So. Uh, how do we connect it? I, I'm sorry, I will leave it like this just so it doesn't interfere with, uh, with the live, live presentation anymore. Uh, how do we connect the database to the JIRA ticketing? Uh, this is the uh, asset custom field. Uh, anyone who used the as, uh, JIRA so far know that there are various types of uh, custom field that can be configured configure for your purpose. Uh, asset custom field is a bit different. It's one field that can present whatever you'd like through the query. So best way to understand it is to uh, to think of it as a, a query on a click so these are the s these are the the scopes where you can enter the correct uh, query and it will present you with the detail that you were looking for so in, in example you can limit it for a certain user which can uh, be searched through or you can have a default value based on a different custom field and stuff like that so i can better show you that again through the live 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 ex example of uh, what's going on so let's go for example to the customer portal and let's say we would like to request a new <coughs> hardware okay uh, so as you can see here we have the field that raised this request in behalf of and that's basically the reporter if I change that reporter for example to one of our co-workers you will notice that the default value will be automatically set to an object with the same name so that's what I explained previously in uh, asset custom field that's done through the AQL so basically the query of that field is set to match the reporter in the exact value of the of the database and then you can go to a summary and say request new you can also notice one of the good perks of uh, Jira uh, service management is that you will get uh, provided with the uh, knowledge base and probably the answer if you can sort it out on yourself and why we need it right and now the second part so this is how you can update things manually and now I wanted to present you how you can use the asset to create a dynamic environment when you're when, when you come to a ticketing and to your process so if we go to available peripherals we will see that we have no available option because this field is uh, dependent on the previous field and that means that we can only select available peripherals that are available in the specific office because we created a reference between those objects so each available object that is in stock is connected to a certain office so if I go here and choose an office that is for example Belgrade I will have now available options for peripherals that are in stock that are not broken and that are, that is available for use for that purpose now this is only a beginning uh, the classification of what needs to go there can be further on based on uh, uh, previous uh, on, on the reporter uh, for example if he's a senior if he's intermediate how you classify who 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 get what equipment that can also be automated uh, further use is in case the Belgrade is empty you can get uh, a uh, list of object that is in the same country that can be shipped uh, really fast so you don't have to order new or create anything else and uh, let's say he need a new laptop and yeah we will uh, add it and we will create this ticket now let's go to an agent queue so you can 
<coughs> see how does it look. So this is the this is the graphic uh, presentation of uh, custom field asset custom field, and it and its object. If we go here now, this is what I wasn't able to show you previously because of the PowerPoint, but you can see all the things that is related to our coworker Igor. So at this point, he's the part of the office Belgrade. He is related to that. He's related to his. Uh, he already have certain thing on, on his name, uh, his uh, job title that can be used for a further search. I will show you that because Jira have uh, integration or you can call the NyQL function through the filtering so that can give you additional power when you, when you want to uh, route the tickets and, and, and stuff like that. So this is the graphic, graphic presentation of it. You can change the depth of, of the connection. So for example, you can have a further and see how this is all related. You can have an owner, you can, so this is if you go in depth to see everything related to Belgrade office, et cetera, et cetera. But at this point, we just want to focus on, on our coworker. Here. Now that part of uh, how you can create a dependency based on an object is, is presented. I want to now show you how uh, objects can be automated and or in this case we now have available uh, peripheral so all, 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 all items show in this custom field are in stock they are not broken like I mentioned and they are in office Belgrade. and for in case uh, this is something that needs to be approved by a manager or staff or someone who is responsible for that and he say yeah okay we can assign this to him and we place it in progress this will trigger automation that will update the attributes of uh, those objects. So as you recall, Igor previously didn't possess anything in his name or the SEER 315381 didn't have an owner. Uh, but now we change that and I just, because I need to refresh it because it's cache. And yeah, it didn't trigger the automation again. Okay, I apologize for this, but let's give him some time. There we go. So this is updated now, and we now see that uh, available peripheral is no longer there because it's no longer available. We changed the status of it and put it in action because it's no longer in stock. One of our uh, users have it, and we updated the owner of it, and we also updated the, uh, the laptop that is currently owned by our coworker. But if we pull this and go, we will see that uh, status has changed and that owner is now Igor. So that is something that can be achieved through an automation and how the uh, asset can be further utilized. The second thing that I wanted to present is uh, how we can uh, manipulate and use the at actual attributes of an object inside of uh, filtering. Because uh, now, as you know, filtering is working based on a, a set of rules when you, where you said, okay, I want uh, this project uh, with this custom field and that custom field need to have a certain value. What attribute add to it is basically you said, uh, okay, I want this project and I want uh, an object that have a certain attribute. So in our situation, even in the tickets that are not uh, currently have an office inside of it, but have uh, a reporter detail filled in or reporter detail added, as, as I mentioned on a previous ticket, you can filter it out and say, an uh, AQL function that will say I need all the tickets where the reporter is, uh, where the reporter have an attribute of uh, Belgrade office, and I will get all of this. You know, and if we go, for example, to one of the tickets that uh, do not possess, as you can see, an office, it will still show up on the on the query because we are not filtering a certain custom field; we are filtering the values of an attribute of an object here. So this is really powerful thing when you consider the ticket routing, ticket routing, and you have a co company that's working on uh, several either countries or continents and things like that. Then can, again, this can further be utilized by creating special specific rule to notify who needs to be notified, and, and further on. It can also be saved as a filter applied to a dashboard, so you can have a specific dashboard who will be uh, in the same project but assigned to a certain group of people. <laughs> okay, I just explained this because I <laughs> I'm going too far when I want to, uh, you know, not, not be left unspoken. Uh, now the interesting part, uh, get that data to an insight. Now, uh, 
I would like to start with the discovery, discovery, and that's the part where you saw the hosts. Uh, uh, discovery is a service that can be applied to a certain uh, server and then can be uh, configured to target the uh, IP ranges or whatever it is that you need to be conf uh, target. It can work as a service or we can apply an agent to a certain uh, item like a uh, personal laptop, which is not always with the same IP or in, in, in network, uh, to a phone and everything that are part of your uh, asset. Uh, that way it will gather all the information like users, if you recall, like uh, specification of it, uh, permissions, applied patches, and uh, I, can, I can basically show you again <coughs> the level of the details. So this is all done automatically. And as you can see here, we have licenses, file system storages, CPUs, network interface, application, and even application services where you can have uh, all the, the, the details that you would prefer based on a VMI query that you can apply. Uh, how this operate? It's, it's, run, uh, uh, it's run through a scripts that are powered by PowerShell. And when you, and when you apply on a certain scan, those, those script, it will pull out the data. Uh, since they are available to you, you can manipulate them and change the scan, whatever you would like. Uh, recently, we have a request to add a uh, logon or the responsible user who is triggering certain service or application in uh, application service in this matter. So we altered the, the, the pattern, so it pulled additional data through the VMI query. And this is a powerful tool, by my opinion. Second and third are JSON and CSV import. Uh, uh, what is important to understand about this is that when you provide us with one of those documents that contain that, we can create a uh, uh, mapping of importing the, the, the data. Uh, that means that that data can, uh, through the import, be related as you prefer. So we create everything and you can just process to uh, apply the new and updated version of that document and it will automatically update all the objects inside. Like, again, I would like to emphasize that it will automatically connect the objects, update their references, and everything that is changed based from the previous. And that mapping is saved, so you don't have to do it every time, once you know what you want. And the last part is external import that is still in, uh, in use. It's in use, but it's also in development. That means that you can connect outside sources, so you import the data automatically. And it basically works the uh, same as, uh, as, as the previous. Once you create the mapping, it will then be automatically updated and fill in the database. Uh, it is really important that, uh, to, to understand that the asset is, it is standalone. And there is a question, OK, we have some sort of uh, application, or we are already using stuff like this in, in other applications. Yes, you do, but you do not use those applications inside of the JIRA, and that is the huge, huge, huge advantage of it, because not every manager is IT, uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable, not, no, nor is his uh, responsibility to know how other systems work. What you can do with this, you can use, the, the, use those data that you already have and provide him so he can operate smoothly and process can be altered, so it's most cost effective. Also, it will help uh, agents inside of the Jira service management to uh, better understand. As you saw, uh, you have a list of attributes at the click of it. So for every either office or employee, you will have a list uh, of things that agent need to know so he can better relay or route the ticket to whoever is responsible of it. Uh, and now we're come to the last part of my presentation, and that's the form, also a new feature inside of uh, Jira service management that can be utilized for uh, much of things, but we had uh, experience with utilizing it with an asset management. So uh, either you know the standard look of uh, Jira service management ticketing, you just saw it, and this is new thing. Uh, consider it as a PDF uh, document that can be applied to every ticket at every step and you know, just leave the, the, the necessary details or additional details to a certain ticket. But what also can be done through, through this is you can connect every one of those fields to a custom field inside of the JIRA and that, that way you can uh, trigger an automation or manipulate it further. 
how we utilize it is uh, at a certain point in the process, if you want to acquire additional information or create a new object, or for example, you just order a hardware and that hardware has arrived and responsible IT person know all the details at a certain point, he can fill in this form and automatically create an object inside of an asset. And that way you can uh, transfer all your work to a database. <coughs> now, now I remember that uh, important thing is to understand regarding the asset is that all of them have their uh, permissions. So every object schema can be, can be uh, provided to a certain agent for him to maintain and update and do whatever is necessary for it. So this is, th this is the same, but he wouldn't need to do when we know all the detail and we already receive all the details when the uh, end user is providing us with them. So we just keep additional manual work. Uh, I would like to show quickly how, how it can <coughs> how it can look. So let's say we want to order a new laptop and we say we need it for a uh, copy office. Yes, we are. And yeah, let's do it like this. And please remember this. Now this is the standard view as I mentioned before and it can be done like this. And now if we go to an agent view, an agent say, okay, this is something that we need to do and then send it to a responsible uh, person who need to, to order it. And he say, okay, we order it. And uh, please, when it arrives, fill in the details. Uh, we will trigger an automation that will apply the correct uh, form directly to, to, to the process, to the ticket. And if we uh, reload this, we will see that. Now, this is a form view that can be edited by anyone. This is really important because it will not take additional licensing. So an end user who is not an agent can help us and fill in the details which is connected, which are connected to uh, custom fields. And those custom fields will, again, trigger an automation that will create an object based on this. <coughs> now, let me really fast pull out some prepared details for it. Let's go like this to show you. Okay, I need to edit it first. Let's call it like this. Uh, let's call it Blender is Dell. Uh, processor is CPU model is G17, correct. RAM is 16 gigabytes. Value, let's say, 150. We have device ID, which is which is like this. Purchase date can be stored here. And it will warranty will expire in two years, let's say. Okay, when we save as submitted, this will again, like I said, trigger an automation that will create an object based on this and it's easy for us to set. We need to go here and search for it inside of uh, peripherals. There we go. And this is, as you can see here, a uh, newly created one. We have expiry, we have warranty expiration date, we have purchase date, and we automatically create an object that we can further use. Uh, CMDB as, as it is, can be also used to monitor the expiring one. Like I said in the beginning, it can still be used in a traditional way. So you can maintain this, this kind of the, the, the object and the items. 
and it can also uh, process the advanced uh, query that can be saved and further on uh, dedicated agents can monitor those and, and also apply. And I think that. So, what is the fur fur uh, future of an insight? Uh, the most common common thing in the future is uh, asset custom field will be available to be added to a form that will additionally help uh, in the process because it, as as it is now only the standard custom fields are supported by it, but in the future we will be able to use that in the in the same manner. Uh, our focus is to find and to practice the way to integrate it with the most common uh, systems that are out there, like uh, Active Directory. So in, fu in future, you will be able to upload all the uh, employee attributes that you already have inside of it and uh, utilize it as I currently show. So create an object base on it with all the attributes that can be used for, uh, for the fur fur f uh, further purpose. And <laughs> Thank you, thank you for being patient. I hope this was quite clear and that you have some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nenad. It was a really, really good presentation. Thank you. Uh, then thank you, everyone, for uh, staying with us. Uh, we can start the Q&A session right now. So if you have any questions, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, if we have any questions from either the audience here or the on the on the YouTube channel, we can we can answer those. On the YouTube channel, no questions so far. I mean, there was one, but you would yeah, answer. already answered. Yeah. Um, okay, so if uh, there are no questions, uh, I just want to let everybody know that we'll have another session in two days. In two days, uh, in two days uh, in, in Malmo. Uh, we'll cover the same topic, so if everybody missed this one, you can join us uh, on, on the second one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Us on a uh, small uh, gathering uh, in the next room, so we can chit-chat.